Yeah, well, I was uh, one of the first 20 people in Germany uh, to study computational linguistics, which revolves around really understanding language and text using the computer. Uh, and I learned that um, basically uh, the computer is not able uh, to fulfill the promises that we have in uh, science fiction. So I moved over to cognitive neuroscience and uh, studied the brain uh, because that's the only system that we know that uh, adequately can process language. And so um, from that I learned quite a lot uh, how to build software that is different, it's not engineered, it's really organic. Uh, and one of the things that we are seeing in artificial intelligence uh, is deep learning which mimics the brain uh, in neural networks. So. Um, my talk, ah, my talk about uh, uh, artificial intelligence today is going to revolve really around uh, why we need artificial intelligence in health. Uh, that's not a nice to have and I hope that I can convince you that it's really important to apply cognitive computing. We're going to hear more about that in a minute by IBM. Uh, cognitive computing in health. Um, so uh, one of the uh, many words that we are hearing uh, uh, at DLD today is artificial intelligence, cognitive computing, machine learning, and deep learning. Uh, I just wanted to briefly uh, point out as a German engineer, I want to have a definition of that. So artificial intelligence, you can play chess without mimicking the brain, right? Uh, so artificial intelligence is a bit bigger uh, than cognitive computing. Com cognitive computing is trying to mimic the brain uh, apply language and think about fields um, and certainly we use machine learning. Uh, machine learning can be used for everything but uh, here in cognitive computing I think it's very important. And one subfield of um, machine learning again is deep learning. So deep learning uh, is exploding and that's Google Trends. Uh, so uh, all of the publications that are really solving uh, artificial intelligence problems right now like uh, Google DeepMind uh, winning Go against the human master, uh, that's deep learning, right? So. Uh, one of the other topics I want to address is do we really need big data for artificial intelligence? And the answer is a clear yes and no. Um, simply what you see here is uh, a work done by uh, Mount Sinai Clinic in New York uh, which I really admire because what they did is they looked at 11,000 um, uh, individuals uh, uh, with uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, but they analyzed the health records and genome data. Uh, and what happened is that, that they were uh, extracting three different subtypes of diabetes uh, just because of big data and machine learning. So that's a very good example of um, how to uh, apply that. But uh, not for all of the health problems you really need big data uh, and that's uh, uh, what we're seeing here. So we're um, uh, working with the Charité which is the biggest clinic in Europe uh, in Berlin uh, to analyze um, uh, tissue data uh, and what you see is that a histologist, he's looking at this data to determine whether uh, you should uh, get a chemotherapy or uh, uh, your cancer cut out, uh, which is very important, and he's looking at the number of cancer cells that you have. Uh, now humans uh, have an overlap of 60%, so humans are not very precise at determining this. Uh, a histologist is seeing 200,000 pictures um, in his life, uh, and the point is a deep learning network uh, using a graphics card that you can buy at Best Buy can process this data in two weeks. Uh, and you need about a thousand pictures just uh, to learn um, uh, to become as good as a human. So it's really important. Uh, my biggest point here today is uh, this. Knowledge is exploding. We have 28,000 articles published every day. Uh, whereas an average scientist is reading 4,000 papers during his whole life. So there is no way that you can, as a scientist, catch up with the knowledge that is produced in health. Uh, here you see the costs rising for putting knowledge into the brain uh, of people and at the same time you see here one single molecule in the human cell, uh, the mTOR, which is determining whether uh, the cell is dividing or uh, getting cancer or 
uh, dying is exploding here to a number that reached 3,000 just last year, which means that not even the people in that field can catch up with the knowledge that is produced. At the same time, the health system is exploding, not only in terms of cost, but also in terms of how old we get and we use the health system more and more. So we clearly need to do something around that. Uh, namely, we need to reduce the cost and increase the quality as well as uh, improve prevention. What you here see is the difference between USA and Japan. What you clearly want to achieve is that you move uh, far to the left, reducing the costs and far to the right, uh, increasing lifespan. Um, when we're looking at the, the single cell and understanding this, uh, this is the networks that we get when we are looking at molecules, genes, and a cell, uh, getting the nutrition and working on it. Here is again somewhere hidden this mTOR molecule that we've seen. Uh, here people have produced networks saying uh, what is the um, relationship between Parkinson and cancer versus uh, cancer and diabetes. And both is revolving around this single molecule. At the same time, there is so many uh, information out there in the literature and people are building these networks by hand. What could happen if we build an artificial intelligence that is building this understanding of a single cell uh, into the computer? We could build way better drugs, right? Uh, speaking of drugs, we have the problem that a drug-drug interaction is killing 100,000 people in the US per year. So um, this is really a problem. People are taking multiple drugs and these drugs don't fit together. On the left hand side you see that the number of drugs that we are developing is increasing. So this um, danger is really exploding. Uh, we need a software that understands what drug fits to the other uh, so that we get reduced set of side effects. Again, this can be done in software. Uh, so our company is really thinking about um, addressing the whole uh, health um, uh, continuum with understanding uh, text as well as pictures, certainly machine learning, but also a profound knowledge of uh, biology. Um, but what we want to do is we want to bring the question that you have um, to the community of knowledge in health we want to bring that uh, uh, to the hands of the researcher, to the pharmacologist, to the doctor, even to the patient, um, by applying uh, an artificial intelligence that you can write your own. So you don't need consultants, you don't need a cloud service, you don't need all of that. Uh, what you need is access to knowledge, like patents, publications, uh, as well as your own data if you're a company, and you build your own artificial intelligence to answer these questions. This is what we do. Uh, we do that with pharma companies uh, as well as hospitals and publishers. And so uh, one of the, the grand questions here is always, uh, will artificial intelligence kill jobs? And my clear answer today, at least, in health is no, it's not. Um, and uh, this is actually an analysis by The Guardian where they looked at, um, hey, technology is going to kill jobs. No, the answer is no, it's not going to kill jobs, just that people will work something different. And what you see is, and this is giving me hope, especially for the health sector, uh, during the last 140 years, the number of people uh, that work in the caregiver's business actually increased 12-fold, and that was before software. So my dream with our software is actually that we do not replace the doctor uh, and um, you know, move the decisions about uh, therapy and so on to the computer, but actually that we free up the time for the doctor to have more time with the patient. Uh, that's the important thing. I have uh, parents that are 80 years old and they are getting proper treatment, um, but the time that you have by the payer defined that you can spend with your patient is about seven minutes per day. Uh, I want to increase that so that uh, really you can hold the hand, you can listen to the story, and you can uh, apply what is human to you. And we don't need uh, silicon for that. That's it.